So this presentation is, is going to identify and review the governance and guidelines that serve as the framework for dam and levee safety risk analysis. This is kind of the why. These are the rules of the game. Why are we doing what we are doing? Our learning objectives here, we're trying to explain the historic context for tolerability of risk concepts. We're going to be defining tolerable risk guidelines for dam and levee safety. And then we're going to be comparing dam and levee risk to flood risk. Those are some terms that we throw out. What is dam and levee risk? How does it compare to flood risk? Are they the same or are they different? It's important to note that there are differences in the federal agencies. So there's four federal agencies that kind of operate under the umbrella of FEMA and risk analysis. We have the Corps, we have Reclamation, there's FERC, and there's TVA. And each of those agencies serves different functions. Each of those agencies manages their structures a little bit differently. For example, the core, we own and operate all of our dams. We are the self-regulated owner. For our levees, we have variable owners and operators. We act as a self, um, we act as a regulator, but we don't own those. But for an agency like FERC, all of their dams are privately owned and they act as the regulator. So it's important to recognize that there are differences in the way that the agencies interact with their structures and regulate their structures because that defines a lot of the policy and guidance that we release and how we implement that guidance in our risk assessment and risk analysis programs. A little background and history on, on risk analysis and risk assessment and, and why we do what we do. Our risk guidelines are a tolerable risk. They have a, a long lineage from several industries and countries. Key guidelines have typically followed disasters, such as the, the Piper Alpha failure or the Teton Dam failure. Uh, and many of our foundational principles that are used uh, in the Federal Risk Management Guidelines can trace their principles back to the UK's Health and Safety Executive and ANCOLD. And some of these principles also come from international guidelines from nuclear facilities. There are two federal guidance documents for dam and levee safety risk management. We have the federal dam safety guidelines and the federal risk management guidelines. And these documents really serve as the, the guiding principles for all that we do. So these documents up here are kind of the head of the spear. This is where we take all of our, our, guiding, our guidance and gu uh, guidance documents from. And then underneath those, each agency takes those guidance documents and then uses them to implement their own policy. So each agency has a little bit different implementation of that policy and that's then released as agency specific guidance and information. A little bit on the federal um, guidelines for dam safety risk management. Um, it's a good document, it's about 50 pages and it contains 16 guiding principles behind what all the federal agencies do to manage and assess risk. So the first one that we have here is life safety is paramount. And of, of all the guiding principles, this is, this is kind of the guiding principle that rises above the others, right? Life safety is paramount. That's, that's kind of how we operate our dam safety and levee safety programs. Life safety is paramount. That's always the first and foremost thing that we pay attention to when we make our dam and levee safety decisions. We're going to see a lot of information this week about how to calculate risk in terms of life safety. However, at the same time, each agency has its own legal authorities and management entities, and um, the federal dam guidelines or the guidelines for dam safety risk management doesn't dictate how each agency does their own business. Instead, it provides a framework that each agency can then use to adapt their own business processes and individual legal authorities. So much of the work for individual risk or probability of failure comes from historical valuations of failure rates for uh, event frequencies. There's some references on the slide out to the right. It's working, but some references on the right side of the screen that you can, uh, that you can look at. And you can find them in the A9 chapter of best practices. It gives a little bit of background on some of this information, but they all boil down to trying to figure out what the, the historical failure rate of all dams are worldwide. We've been studying these rates for a long time. We've been studying them since the 70s. And what we found is the rates have remained fairly stable for the last 30 years or so. 
So this idea of background risk is really a key concept in the formation of the original failure rates both uh, in the UK and Australia and the United States. And the, the key principle here is we try to ensure for all of our structures that the, the risk that an individual feels from a dam or a levee that we own and operate doesn't present a risk of, of death, a background risk, greater than what that individual would already feel from all other causes. So here we see a chart. This chart represents the mortality rate from all causes of death. This is actually for a 10-year-old girl. And what we can see here is that around the age of 10, this is the lowest expected mortality rate from all causes that a 10-year-old girl could feel. So we see that that rate is between 1 and 100 and 1 in 1,000. Most agencies have then taken that historical rate and have chosen a failure threshold of 1 in 10,000 to make sure that our structures don't present a risk that would increase the background risk felt by any individual from all causes. This slide represents how things can change. So we've studied these failure rates for a long time, a long time, but then we have something like a pandemic that comes in and throws everything out of whack. It throws all of our data out of whack. So this is an example of how we need to be constantly analyzing and reanalyzing our data to make sure that as things shift over the course of history, we can shift with them so that we know, are we still in the right spot or do we need to reevaluate? Let's discuss some, some terminology and framework. Now we have a background on the principles. Let's discuss terminology for risk analysis. So like I said before, terminology is a minefield. Every agency or every field uh, in industry has a different definition of, of risk and the terms that go along with it. Like I said before, we will define risk in this course as the likelihood of a structure being loaded uh, multiplied by the adverse structural performance and then multiplied by the magnitude of the resulting consequences. And then we have this concept of tolerable risk. So tolerable risk is defined as risk within a range that society can live with to secure the benefits provided by the dam or levy, provided by the structure. Tolerable risk and the idea of tolerable risk is not that the risk is acceptable. It's instead saying that the risk is able to be tolerated but should still be reduced as practicable as much as possible. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. So risks are generally evaluated by comparing against two types of tolerability. We have individual and societal. The individual risks, which are sometimes simplified to the probability of failure of the structure, are risks that are posed by the failure of a structure to the maximally exposed population, maximally exposed individual. So we use the term individual most at risk. That's what we say a lot of times, the person or individual most at risk. So sometimes we, we make some very simplifying assumptions when we calculate individual risk. Like I said before, if a person most at risk is assumed to have an exposure rate of 100%, so they're always there, and they are assumed to always perish in the event of a failure, then the individual risk that that individual feels is equal to the probability of failure for that structure. If the structure, if the structure fails, then that individual will lose their life. And the reason that we evaluate it this way is we are trying to write guidance that provide a level of protection for all individuals, even if the consequences due to failure are low. So if we have a structure where life loss is expected to be low, to get around our tendency to minimize the impact of that structure, well, we look at the, the individual most at risk. We still need to meet that threshold in order for that project or that structure to be tolerable. So the next we have societal risk, and societal risk is a little bit more difficult to describe. So this is the risk posed by a structure to a group or groups of people. And what we found is that society is generally increasingly averse to catastrophes that affect larger groups of people. So stated another way, the more people that are affected by catastrophe, 
the less willingness society has to put up with it, the less willingness society has to tolerate those larger catastrophes. So there are many ways to portray and evaluate societal risk. We have to figure out how to take that, that aversion for larger catastrophes and portray it in a way that's easy to understand. And dam agencies have all chosen to use little FN or big FN charts with sloping diagrams to represent society's increasing aversion. We're gonna talk more about those charts in a few slides so that you can, can see them, but that's how we portray all of our risk and that's how we evaluate that societal risk. So let's talk about dam and levee risk versus flood risk. What's the difference? Well, most of what we're gonna be talking about this week is going to be dam or levee risk. Dam or levee risk is the risk posed by potential poor performance of the dam or levee, and it's also known as incremental risk. So when we talk about portraying risks on a little FN chart, what we're talking about is incremental risk. So we're talking about dam and levee risk. However, there's also flood risk. Flood risk represents the risk that a population feels, even if the structure doesn't fail or acts as it is intended to. If a dam acts, uh, operates as intended, there's still some risk that society down, downstream feels from it. If we have to make large releases, there will still be flooding. So dam risk or flood risk represents the, the, the risk as, um, as felt by the downstream population when the structure operates as intended. This is also referred to as background risk or residual risk, depending on which agency you're, you're talking with. But it's important to note that the tolerability concepts that we're gonna be discussing in this presentation and discussing this week are in terms of incremental risk. Yeah. Sure, yeah, so a lot of times breach we define as uncontrolled release of the, the reservoir, but if there's a, a failure and that results in a, a release that we don't intend, usually that may not result in high risk because those releases may not be as large as a, a full breach of the embankment or the structure, um, but it would still count as, as incremental risk because it's, it's releases that we didn't plan. Resulting in consequences. Yes. So um, consequences may ensue even though it's not a catastrophic breach. So this chart here is out of the Federal Risk Management Guidelines and it kind of gives a, a roadmap for our risk analysis and risk assessment process. So we're gonna be focusing a lot this week on these two inner green boxes, the failure modes identification or PFMA, potential failure modes analysis, and risk analysis. This is where we estimate our incremental risks. We're not really gonna to touch a whole lot on risk assessment. Remember, risk analysis is where we evaluate risks and risk assessment is where we make a decision based on that risk analysis. But this building block concept is, is used by all the, the core agencies in dam and levy safety. And then this risk management process occurs within the risk management framework. So this flow chart provides the, the roadmap or, or the, the process for risk management for, for all federal agencies. So in the inner loop, we have our, our risk assessment and risk analysis process. On the outer loop, we have more of our, our routine O&M um, operations. So what we're going to be talking about this week is really going to be focused on this inner loop here, this risk assessment, risk analysis process. But it's important to realize that the concepts that we've studied this week can be applied to any part of this flowchart. So let's talk about a little bit about tolerability and the concept of tolerability. So this triangle represents the concept of tolerability that we've discussed a little bit. There are fundamental concepts that underpin the tolerable risk guidelines. And a few of those are shown on the left of the slide here. We have efficiency. Efficiency is the need for society to distribute and use available resources to achieve the greatest benefit. So that's what we strive for. We wanna be efficient in our decisions that we're making with our funding decisions that we're making to reduce risk as best we can. And then equity. We wanna make sure that individuals are treated the same regardless of where they are. So we wanna make sure that our decisions for dam and levee safety reflect that. We don't make decisions that 
prioritize one group of people over the other. We want to be equitable with all the decisions that we're making. So we're looking at this triangle. We have three categories where we're discussing tolerability. Up at the top, we have risks that are deemed unacceptable. This is risk that cannot be justified except in extraordinary circumstances. On the flip side, down here, we have risks that are broadly acceptable, that are regarded as insignificant and adequately controlled. I want to point out that this threshold here, you see one in a million with a question mark, that threshold is difficult to define. Not all agencies have agreed on, on what makes a risk broadly acceptable. So there's a, a little bit of, of fuzziness and gray area there. And then here in the middle, we have our range of tolerability. So this is where people in society are prepared to accept risk in order to secure benefits. However, we still strive to reduce risk as low as reasonably practicable, or ALARP, as low as reasonably practicable. Um, we still try to strive to reduce those risks as much as we can, as long as the decision to do so makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about guidelines. So this is where we're going to be getting into those charts that I was talking about. So this chart on the left is from Reclamation's Public Protection Guidelines. And you can see that there are several dashed lines on this chart that represent the tolerable risk thresholds. So we have a dotted horizontal line at 1 in 10,000. That represents the individual risk threshold that we talked about. And then we have a, hor a sloping line that is equal to 1e to the minus 3, or 1 in 1,000. And this line is calculated by taking the, the probability of failure and the estimated life loss. So we multiply those together, and at every point, the product of those two are equal to 1 in 1,000. So this represents that um, society's aversion to catastrophes that affect larger groups of people. As we affect larger groups of people with our, our failures, we have a lower threshold for the annual probability of failure. And then we also have a zone down in the bottom right-hand corner of the matrix where we have a horizontal line that's bounded by one in a million failure probability and a vertical line bounded by 1,000 life loss. And this represents a, a zone of low consequence or low probability of failure and high consequence where it gets a little bit more tricky to manage and uh, make decisions as it comes to risk assessment. So this chart here is uh, from the core. This is our societal risk chart. You'll see there's a lot of similarities between these charts. Um, not a whole lot different. But in general, one thing to, to note is when risk is plotted on this chart, if risk plots above the guideline, we're in that unacceptable range. That's where we need to reduce risks, make decisions to reduce risks to get it to a tolerable level. If risks plot below this guideline, we're in that range of tolerability. So the core hasn't really defined where broadly acceptable, that broadly acceptable category is. So in general, if we plot below this guideline, we're going to be looking at our ALARP requirements and ALARP principles to try to reduce risks further as practicable. But if it's not practicable, we are in that range of tolerability. So here's a couple more charts. The chart on the left is Ann Cold's current chart. The chart on the right is from the New South Wales Dam Safety Committee. And you'll see again that a lot of these <clears throat> thresholds and guidelines are similar to what we've seen from the Bureau and the Corps. So over here we see we have a sloping line and a horizontal line here. And it's interesting that there are two sets of lines here, one for existing dams and one for new dams, which is interesting. And then over here, we have a, a zone where that broadly acceptable range of risk has been defined discreetly. But you can see there's a lot of similarities between all of these charts and all of these guidelines that agencies go by. All right, so let's talk big FN chart versus little FN chart. What do those mean? So there, uh, there's one subtle difference between the charts that we've seen, and that's the way that the data is portrayed on them. And as we'll discuss during the presentation on combining and portraying risks later this week, one uses a cumulative curve, which you can see here on the left, and one uses annual probability of failure and average life loss pairs, or FN pairs. That's what those represent. Now, the total FN... Uh, total risk FN point on this chart 
and the point of curvature on the cumulative chart should be essentially the mathematical equivalent of one another. They're not for these two because these two don't actually represent the same project. But in general, those two points on the charts should uh, be mathematically equivalent. So this cumulative curve is more commonly used internationally. This is what you'll see a lot in international dam safety. Uh, however, the little FN chart with the FN pairs is a little bit easier to understand. It's a little bit more intuitive for a decision maker to look at and see, oh, that's where the risk plots. Uh, but they are both used and they are both portrayed to decision makers to give them the full range of information that they need to make responsible decisions. We've mentioned ALARP considerations uh, several times, but what are they? ALARP, or as low as reasonably practicable, is a balance between risk reduction and cost. They measure and represent reasonable and prudent low cost actions. So there's a couple different ways that we can evaluate ALARP measures and there's different levels of analysis that we can go, uh, go toward when evaluating ALARP measures. We can either do a rigorous evaluation of disproportionality or we can do a more qualitative assessment where we figure out kind of where this break point is to figure out when an ALARP measure is reasonable, when it's practical, and when it's not. All ALARP measures must be evaluated within the context of those tolerable risk frame, uh, the tolerable risk framework that we've been talking about and the existing risk of the structure. So we don't evaluate ALARP considerations when we have a risk that plots above the range of tolerability. Because at, at that point, we're not talking about reducing risk as low as practicable. We need to get risk down to a tolerable level. So those ALARP measures and ALARP considerations are really evaluated when we are plotting below the societal guideline, and we're in that range of tolerability. All right, let's finish up by talking about urgency. So this table is included in the federal risk management guidelines, and it characterizes the urgency of actions related to individual structures. Each agency has adopted <clears throat> this table into their own governance. Um, at the core, we've divided our inventory into categories based on risk and urgency. Um, so you might hear DSAC, LSAC, Dam Safety Action Classification, and Levy Safety Action Classification. This is where that's coming from. So these, these categories represent the different DSAC and LSAC ratings that we assign to our projects. And the idea behind that is we want to be sure that we are prioritizing all of our structures internally in a, a consistent manner. But we also want to make sure that we are classifying all structures uh, across all of our inventories responsibly. So when we talk about the core versus FERC versus the Bureau versus TVA, uh, we want to make sure that the way that we're classifying our, our dams and levees is consistent so that one agency is not doing something completely different than the other. So these categories, if you were not able to intuitively figure out from the color coding, I means bad. Low means good. Green bad, or I'm sorry, red bad, green good. So it's a little bit more nuanced than that, of course. And there is another column on this chart that's not shown here on this slide that represents what kind of actions would be appropriate for each level of classification. All right, so here's one very brief example. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. This is a, a little FN chart for a particular structure. So we can see here the 1E minus 3 societal guideline is right here. So we've got a lot of potential failure modes that are plotting above that 1E minus 3 guideline, and we combine all of them together to arrive at a total risk for the project. We plot the structure like this and make a decision whether the total risk justifies action to reduce risk or whether additional study is necessary to reduce uncertainty. And one other thing of note, we also plot the risk of our structures with and without intervention. And an interesting point, in the dam safety portfolio, we prioritize all of our structures based on the with intervention estimate. In our levy safety, or levy safety program, we prioritize all our structures based on the without intervention estimate. So that's a, a little tidbit, a little um, strange part about how we classify our structures that is important to keep in mind. All right. Any questions on governance and guidelines?
line on the left. Oh, <laughs> you said that line on the left is a is a one to the minus three. So the next one up should be one to minus two, even though it says one to minus three in the gray. Yes. Okay. That should be one e minus two. Okay. Good catch. I just wanted to make sure. Yep. I <laughs> Any other questions? I put everyone to sleep already. They're going to wake up because Bart's up next. We're doing good. He's got his tap dancing shoes on. All right, next we're going to be hearing from Bart Best, who is a, a geotech here in Louisville. He works for the RMC, and he's going to be talking to us about PFMA and SQRA.